hora del día. Y yo estoy muy contenta de que esta tarde el, el profesor Shell Violon de, de la Universidad de Oslo en Noruega venga a darnos una plática sobre lo que ha sido su trabajo durante toda una vida, es muy joven nada más que se pinta el pelo de blanco, este, acerca de su trabajo con estos microfósiles que tienen una belleza extraordinaria y geométrica, simétrica, que son los, los radiolarios. Eh, el profesor Shell Violón obtuvo el grado de doctor en la Universidad de Bergen en el área de biología marina y posteriormente realizó estancias postdoctorales en el campo de geología marina en la Universidad de Oslo. Um, tra a tra bueno, trabajó en la Universidad de Oslo en el área de micropaleontología marina hasta hace dos años, ahora está retirado, pero continúa escribiendo artículos, eh, tiene más de 100 artículos publicados y básicamente están relacionados con las reconstrucciones paleoceanográficas y paleoclimáticas del de <coughs> mar de Noruega y del mar del norte, aunque tiene participaciones con en otras regiones. Una de las cosas que es importante mencionar sobre su trayectoria es que participó en tres expediciones del Deep Sea Drilling Project y del Joint Resolution. Eh, la mayoría de ustedes están familiarizados con lo que significa participar en este tipo de expediciones internacionales y el valor que tiene para la ciencia el realizar estudios en este tipo de secuencias de, que cubren un alcance temporal muy grande. Eh, en las primeras dos, él estudió básicamente la evolución de, del piso oceánico, de cómo se dispersó el piso oceánico en el mar de Noruega y en la última, en 2005, eh, ya en el Joyce Resolution, él estudió básicamente las características paleoclimáticas de los últimos tres millones de años y precisamente el, el inicio de las glaciaciones. Bueno, pues entonces, sin más preámbulos, voy a um, dejarles aquí con Shell. Ok, so we are supposed to start. I think I have a mic here. Okay. The mic is okay. No problem. Okay. So today I want to take you a tour into the absolute north on top of the globe, into the Arctic Ocean. And as you can see from the title, we found some tropical fauna tropical radiolaria in the Arctic Ocean. And we want to discuss this today. How is that possible? Is it fantasy or is it reality? Firstly, for those who don't know what radiolaria are and look like, we should just have a few slides with a short introduction. The radiolaria are single-celled mostly, uh, protozoans. Some families do make colonies, but uh, we are not going to deal with those in this talk. They are common in all oceans, except for a few. The Black Sea, the Baltic, those are not having any regularia. Neither do the White Sea. They are most abundant in the tropics. So in the equatorial Atlantic, let us just assume there are close to 500 different species. We don't know exactly how many, but 500 is a juicy handy estimate. As you go north, the species diversity drops off. And in the Arctic Ocean, we have so far found and identified 60 species. Skeleton, as you know, are mostly of silica, but some do have a siliceous skeleton with a combination of organic material, the feldarians, which used to be radiolaria, which are no longer. We will just give a short mention on that too and radiolaria have existed throughout the whole geolo geologic history, we should say, the last 540 million years. So they are one of the uh, microfossil groups that have been longest in existence continuously. 
how do they look? The order radiolaria, uh, the, 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 the class radiolaria, are divided in different orders. And spermilarians look like this. These are from the Arctic Ocean. And as you can see, they are quite similar looking, but still different. Another order would be the Nessalarians, and they look like this. These are also from the high north, but not exactly from the polar ocean, but from the Norwegian Sea, which is the neighboring sea to the Arctic Ocean. If you know, look on the Arctic Ocean, it has two entrances, from the Pacific and from the Atlantic. And from the Pacific, there is almost no radiolaria inflow, only if once in a while a few specimens. But there is no, a, not a big radiolaria inflow from the Pacific. The next will be the Feudarians. They used to be in the radiolarian group, but they have now been taken outside due to DNA analysis. And this is a new, should we say, approach in radiolarian studies. The DNA is turning upside down on the old taxonomy. So let us just have a look on how they look. They look very different because in this case they have a very spongy skeleton. It is not the solid silica but a more or less like a foamy substance. And since the foamy, just think of a sponge, if you break a sponge open, you're increasing the surface dramatically. So the dissolution is uh, very active on those organisms. So therefore the feudarians are most, mostly gone from deep sea sediments, except in a few the situations. You know, we will return this for those who are uh, here for, for the class also, which we will have later on in the week. We have something called deep sea basins. And in the deep sea basins, we have hyper salinity. The water is so heavy that it's never replaced. And if the water is never replaced, diatoms regularia accumulated. So also the silica concentration in those basins are increasing. So the preservation of opal in those basins are very, very good. It's almost like studying plankton material. You have, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico, Orca Basin. You, may have, you might have heard about that. You have in the Mediterranean, the Tiro Basin. In the Red Sea, there are other basins. So in those, in those basins, we have good preserved should we say, living, but fossils, sub-fossils, radiolarious skeletons. So, if you go to other images, the scanning electron microscopy, then you can see a totally different thing than light microscopes, photographs. These are architectural, should we say, diamonds. They are the dual jewelry in, in, in microfossils as far as I'm concerned. So, you might have heard about this man, the famous German professor Ernst Haeckel. We can also call him the godfather for radiolarian research. He was the one who got the plankton material and sediment material from challenge report and he studied the material in il uh, for 11 years and the material was collected on this ship and the production after 11 years appeared in three giant volumes and he constructed more or less 700 genera and more than 4,000 species however that these numbers are most likely 
super say inflated because he was describing juvenile stages and as you say not adult and in between as different species so growth stages was actually described as separate species that's why the number he made is so high so actually it was deep actually it was uh, uh, too many specimens in his report species in his report just have a look here how he illustrated line drawings with colors here we have some living specimens just have a look how small the pseudopodia can be what you have here are symbionts and when the pseudopodia are extended the symbionts are following with on the pseudopodia however also inside the skeleton or the protoplasm you have symbionts we will show some other photographs too here we have one of the absolute nice and elegant forms these are called acantaria and as you can see along the spine you have myomeres she was said small muscles if they contract the volume of the body is big if they relax the body volume shrinks that means the volume the same weight but the volume is different so you have a buoyancy effect so if they are active and contracted, the, they are floating. If they are relaxing, they are sinking. In this case, we have the symbionts. And as you can see, with special lights, you have the, in, the, the, uh, the chlorophyll is showing up with, with red. And in this case, you have lots of symbionts. In this case, you have less. In this case, you have almost nothing. And what is the purpose for this? Why, why do we have symbionts? Well, uh, we don't know why. But when symbionts are present, they are most likely dinoflagellates. And they are assimilating. That means they are living close to the surface. So this information leads us to some ecological interpretations. I'll read some bottom. If we now go to the topic of the day, I got permission to request material from the Norwegian Polar Institute because they were going to sample north of Spitsbergen. And Spitsbergen is north of Norway. I assume you can all visualize where Spitsbergen is. It's between the northern part of Norway and the North Pole. So it's way north. In this case, you have, you have probably I wouldn't, I wouldn't guess exactly on, 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 the, on, the, on the latitude. But we will come back later on and say that we are having, back in time, warm water all the way up to 81 and a half degree north. And with a very high temperature, which we will return to. But what we have was a set of samples that we got. We got seven samples, and they are located as follows. This is very important. In this, at this location, we had most number of specimens and species. And you can see the temperature here is one and a half degree. The next station, we have three and a half degrees. And then the final and eastern one, which is the deepest one, the same, three and a half degrees. 
three and a half degrees seems to be an every temperature over the most of the of the last decades but we do have some exceptions just to show you before the exception is presented these are typical Norwegian sea and Arctic Ocean spermilarians they are found in different concentrations but we can say that this species is the most abundant very common however once in a while we find these and that is the exception we are returning to we found these which are typical tropical forms in an arctic setting they should not have been there mm -hmm. so in this case we have another set these are the Nesselaria typical species of Nesselaria from the Norwegian Sea uh, on the upper part and typical Arctic and uh, should we say Arctic Ocean specimens below here but at the same time as the tropical Malarians, we found a whole bunch of tropical Nesselarians. It is obvious for those who know a little bit about the radio area, these are tropical forms, subtropical forms. You, cannot, you can never dispute that. But they should not have been here either. So if we now look on the map again, pay attention to this pay attention to this which we call a group and a group and we go to the next slide here we have the stations as you can see and we have some descriptions but let us just focus on this warm water taxa versus cold versus taxa you can see in station 5 you have 85 taxa so in these two stations we have a domination of warm water taxa if you go to the lower lines you can see this in percentage and there is no doubt we have tropical radial area north of Spitsbergen in an arctic station arctic setting how is that possible then we ask ourselves how did we collect the radiolaria and how did we process the samples okay we have tropical radiolaria according to the map in seven stations is it possible that the net was contaminated yes it is possible but it's not possible the way we have discovered these things because you don't get pollution or contamination at seven stations when you are using the, the, same, the same net. The net has been sampling seven places at seven different stations. So contamination, I rule out. The second, you go to the lab and you process. You boil it in peroxide, you boil it in hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid and then you sieve it could it be possible that the sieve was contaminated no because when we are working in the lab we are using soap and a brush and really cleaning the sieve so to so contamination in the sieve is also ruled out therefore we are left with this setting as a fact we have a domination as you can see down here of tropical radial area in the southern and western mo most stations then if we move further north and east you can see that it is as it should have been a domination of the arctic fauna but this component is still 
a mystery. Why is it there? <clears throat> Have anyone earlier reported on tropical radiolarians? No. <coughs> never, never in the Arctic Ocean. Never in the Arctic Ocean. We have two scientists working in the high north. That is the Swedish Kleve, and he collected material in 1899 and published in 1900. But he didn't report on any tropical forms. The Norwegian researcher Jorgensen reported in 1905 and he reported on material collected from Westfjord. What he reported was normal Norwegian sea radiolaria fauna. No tropical forms, no warm water forms. So pay attention to these, to these two names, as you can see down here. During my stay as a postdoc, not a postdoc, but I had a scholarship in Leningrad, no St. Petersburg. I studied together with uh, Petrushevskaya, one of the Russian guru of radiolaria research. And she once told me that she had one time found this species west of Spitsbergen. So she had observed one specimen of a warm water fauna, one specimen. Kryplikova, another Russian colleague, studied in the Barents uh, Sea in 1970s, and she reported internally on this species, which is also warm water, tropical subtropical form. But all her colleagues on the ship and in the laboratory back home said, oh, this is contamination, forget about it. But you know, we have no a few specimens of earlier reported warm water fauna in the Norwegian Sea, but we have nothing in the Arctic Ocean. What you have here are warm water fauna in the Norwegian Sea which are very rare, but you know they represent warm water. So modern research is uh, dealing with factor analysis. So if we say, instead of using the term species, we say warm water fauna or drift fauna, and you collect all that to give a signal to warm water association, then you can use the drift fauna as a species indicating warm water. This is a kind of a tricky thing, but it, 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 it works. So by collecting, you can actually get in, in the real ecological information. So then we ask, do we have any explanation for this occurrence of tropical radiolaria in the Arctic Ocean? Is it an effect of the so-called industrial-induced global warming? Or is it the result of a natural variation in the influx of warm Atlantic water to the Arctic Ocean? As you can see here, you have a time series. And it's produced by Polyakov in 2005. And as you can see here, you have multi-decadal episodes of cold, warm, cold, warm. So it looks as we now are into a kind of a warming period, which in the future we don't know whether it goes into even warmer or, or colder. If there is going to be a repetition, we can see that maybe warm longer and then cold, or it will warm up drastically. Anyway. What we have, and what I wanted you to pay attention to, is the drastic warming around this. There is cold and warming. So in the early 
20s or late 1910s, you can see that we have a phenomenon here. Pine trees in our territory, in, our, uh, in Norway, north of Norway especially, they need three years to reproduce. The first year, they make flowers. The second year, they set the cones. And the third year, the cone are making ready seeds. So three years. So that means our harsh Norwegian, North Norwegian climate doesn't allow pine trees to produce seeds each season. It can go many, many, many years before the pine trees are able to, to produce seeds. So the next will be another information that to the east of Norway we have the Kola Peninsula and on the Kola Peninsula we also have the fjord called Kola Fjord. And as you can see, Knipovic was one of the biologists from Russia who reported in 1921 about, about colonial regularia found in the Barent Sea, East Barent Sea, just before you go into the Kara Sea. And the last one will be another information about the water north of Iceland, which is warmer, much warmer, from a half to four degrees above normal. So actually, in this period, there was a rapid warming of the, of the ocean. And at the same time, the cod fisheries in this area increased. So high and new, she would say, fishy, fishing grounds occurred. West of Greenland, there was a warming in the ocean for three degrees. West of Svalbard, there was a similar warming. So it's quite obvious that here we have something going on. I ask you to pay attention to Kleve and Jorgensen. And you can see they didn't report on any warm water radiolaria fauna. But where in the climatic diagram did they sample? They sampled when it was extremely cold, or should we say normal, normal uh, cold interval sampling periods. So they, we shouldn't expect them to report on warm water fauna. But now we are up here in 2007, 2009, and 2010, as you remember. 2010 was the, day when, uh, the year when we sampled. But here we have another information from roughly the same. Can you see here, 1922? And I will just point on, on a few cases. Here, well, I can't read myself here on this. It's out of focus. But what we can say is that in Oslo, they send out an expedition to Bear Island and Spitsbergen. And since you cannot, you cannot read this, we've, I, will just, I will just say it from the top of my head, the, the way I memorize these different things. Uh, at that time, they discovered all the way to 81.30, roughly, north, no ice. They could navigate all that way north. And at the same time, they found water, Atlantic water, Gulf Stream water, 15 degrees, 15 degrees. Exactly where they measured the 15 degrees is not mentioned here. But it is either west of Spitsbergen or just north of Spitsbergen. But it has never been reported such high temperature, neither in the water nor on, on land in that area. Sorry that we cannot read what they are saying here, because there are some in really in, in interesting information here. But the 15 degrees is very important. 
Why do we have 15 degrees in 1920? Is it CO2 related? Probably couldn't be. Here we have an interesting information. Remember, we sampled in 2010, but this is from 2009. In 2009, we had temperature west of Spitsbergen, seven and a half degree. It should have been three and a half. Year afterwards, four and a half. And we sampled north of Spitsbergen and found tropical radiolaria. So they actually survived north of Spitsbergen where temperature is uh, falling down. Together with this warm water pulse, the chlorophyll was increasing, meaning the primary production was very good, very high. But you can also see that the blue is the average 91 to 2008, and the, what happened in 2009 is earlier. It is two weeks earlier, and it is twice, it's double the value of the average of the same period here. So actually, the warming gave high productivity, and it was earlier. two weeks earlier. Okay, why do we have these fluctuations in temperature? This is a map, or not a map, okay, map and a picture and a graph of two situations. We have the subpolar gyre in the northern Atlantic, as you can see here. And this is very important information because it gives us two, eight, two times. It gives us a warm period, a cold period, A, in 1993, and it gives us a warm situation in B, in 1998. In this case, the subpolar gyre has been reduced. And that reduction, should we say, there was, a, according to the oceanographers, there was a collapse in the subpolar gyre between 95 and 96. That means the driving engine in the North Atlantic collapsed, allowing the Atlantic current, the Gulf Stream, to increase in, probably not too much in speed, but maybe speed too, but at least in volume. And the more volume into the Arctic Ocean, the more heat you put into the ocean. And the more warm water you transport, the more warm water fauna and flora you introduce. So, Sutton and Allen, they mentioned that the temperature anomaly from here to there takes roughly eight to nine years. And that age estimate is also confirmed by Alvarez Garcia et al. However, the advection time is much shorter. It is from three to four years. So, if we have at the start of the Gulf current, roughly four or 500 radiolarian species. The warm, water, warm, water for, uh, warm water fauna is being transported across the Atlantic, and when it reach the Iceland Faroe Ridge, how many species are we left with? We don't know. But we know that there are roughly 60 species in the Fram Strait and from Strait is the position between Spitsbergen and Greenland before entering the Arctic Ocean. So you can see based on this, there is actually a drastic drop 
in number of species. And in this case, Norway is just behind here in this position. And you can see that the Svino profile, if you have a warm water pulse here, the warm water pulse over here takes roughly, this is the warm water pulse indicated here, but it takes roughly one and a half year to reach from here to there. So that means that fauna needs lots of years, many years, from the state of Florida to the Fram Strait. So that means that the five to seven years of total transport from Florida Strait to the Fram Strait can be split up in this. Three to four years to cross the Atlantic and another two to three years from the Faroe Island to the Fram Strait. Okay. What can we do with these numbers? How long does a radiolaria live? There, there is some discussion on this. But 30 days is a um, round and an acceptable estimate. So if you have five or seven years of transportation, that you give room for 60 to 84 radiolaria generations. So roughly 20% of the original Gulf of, uh, Gulf of um, Mexico fauna is being transported all the way north. So will these 60 to 84 generations be enough time to adapt to the rough and tough, harsh conditions in the Arctic Oceans? Well, let us have a look on this. We have ontogenetic onto, onto, onto stages. We have one, what happened here? Did I touch the wrong button? Okay. Okay. This species which you are discussing now, Didymosertes tetratalamus, this is the first stage of skeletal development in polar view. This is the first, uh, this is the second stage in polar view. And this is the second stage in lateral view. And here we have the third stage in lateral view with equatorial band. And here we have the same stage, but in a polar view. And here we have another stage with larger equatorial band and a fifth stage with a third shell properly developed. And here the final stage, the sixth, with polar caps even. If this is a transportation from Florida Strait all the way to the Arctic, five, seven years, it's not likely. Since we have adult forms and baby forms in the same sample, it is most likely a result of ongoing reproduction. So these tropical forms actually reproduced as they crossed the Atlantic, as they crossed the Norwegian Sea, and also as they entered the Arctic Ocean. So, here we have the stages. And since this species is found in all growth stages, my conclusion is, or our conclusion is, that 
this species is living and reproducing in these harsh environments. And you can see, we already now extended, that this reproduction can actually occur between 1.5 and 3.5, which was the actual temperatures that we measured at that station where the samples were collected. Yeah. So let's go to another species, Dictyocorona trincatum, which is another warm water radiolaria. And as you can see here, this is an adult form which we have found in our material, but mostly we find these forms. Most likely we find these forms. And uh, we don't see any special thing about the longevity of the species. It is, you can see, longevity between 15 and, eight and 28 degrees. It's almost the same. But we don't know anything when we go down to the temperature interval we are talking about now. So, Since we have so many specimens of this, they are dominating in this fauna. We don't have many adult forms. Could it be that there is something happening with the reproduction? Reproduction is actually something which normally takes place in adult forms. Could it be that reproduction is also taking place at the younger stage. Maybe not younger in terms of days, but younger in terms of skeletal development. So we don't know how old this is, but from a skeletal point of view, it's a juvenile form. But in terms of longevity, maybe it is close to death and ready to reproduce without producing a developed skeleton. That we don't know anything about yet. So, again, we have lots of these juvenile forms. They are most no likely not transported from the Strait of Florida. They are most likely a result of reproduction. So, tropical radiolarians in the polar basins. Yes, that is reality. We have collected them from living plankton. Another thing we can just mention briefly here. This Canadian girl or lady in her team, they collected picoplankton, which is less than three micron, and they found an whole bunch of, radio, of, of, of radiolarian DNA. So are they small spores, sexual elements, or are they preserved radiolarian DNA in one or another form? That we don't know. But she followed up with another paper in 2010, and she reported that the DNA was 40% of the retrieved clones. That means there must be quite a lot of radiolaria, but we don't find quite a lot. So this is a puzzle, but the puzzles are supposed to be solved, but they will not be solved today and not tomorrow. So we have lots of things to work with. Amphimilis acetosa is one of the most dominant species in the Arctic Ocean. And you remember Lovejoy, which we saw? She reported her fauna from the Beaufort Sea. And the Beaufort Sea is over here. You have high numbers here from the sediment. You have high numbers here from the plankton. So actually, if Amphimnesia acetosa is the most dominant species in terms of percentage and fauna, maybe also these 
clones that she reported belongs to this species. That's a speculation from my side, but that's most likely. Okay, that's just documented who these data are gathered from. But as you can see, this species is typical cold water. It is present in the Chukchi Sea. It is present in the Barents Sea. It is present on the Iceland Plateau. And it's present in one particular fjord in Norway. Those who are following the course will get the key to that one. Here you can see something rather peculiar. These are typical forms in the Norwegian Sea and also in the Arctic Ocean. So are these two. When we worked, you can see most of the Arctic Ocean sediment samples are sand, 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 and sand. And then you find one radiolaria, another radiolaria, etc., etc. So therefore, it's very difficult to estimate on the microscope the size differences here. So they look very similar, but they are different. So that means that in this area, we have actually a active and ongoing speciation. And when we have this introduction of warm water fauna with a new gen uh, genetic, uh, should we say, information, how will this influence the local fauna that already is there? Will there be any mixing? Will this introduced fauna persist? Will it disappear? That we don't know. Okay, to be closing up here. Is the inflow of tropical fauna to the Arctic Ocean a recent event, or has it occurred earlier? That we don't know. But if we now assume that these warm water radiolaria is the result of an increase in warm water, increased in the Gulf Stream, then we have some clues from other elements. Martel and other Russian colleague, he reported on unexpected feature, a mass accumulation of thermophile planktonic foraminifera assemblages. And this is from the core of the Lap Laptev Sea that is way into the polar basin. And this is what he found. 6,000 years ago, roughly, a rough estimate, because there are not that much calcium carbonate to do C14 datings. But a sophisticated, should we say, ed educated guess will be 6,000 years ago. This is the fauna they got. A warm water foraminifera, it's almost 70%, and other warm water foraminifera in high percentages. How is that possible? Here is 1,000 years later, roughly, the same situation. <coughs> Globigerinus ruber, also it's pink, pinkish uh, variety is included. Something is happening, warm water pulses. Then we go to another author who reported on exactly the same. That is the same um, expected high occurrences of warm water fauna. And you can see these three events. You have, in one sample, you had 100% tropical temperate. And in other samples, you had varieties of warm water fauna. This is also, to me, a documentation that our interpretation that the warm water fauna which you have seen is a result of pulsation of the Gulf Stream. So the warming, as we see in the Arctic Ocean today, is most likely a result of increased inflow of warm water. Not so much, um, uh, should we say, 
the industrial warming. Here we have also a typical situation of the present day plankton for foraminifera fauna. You have here most likely cold water fauna, but in the water in the plankton samples, we find a half to two percent empty skeletons of warm water fauna. So they can, they, from where they come, I don't know, but it can also be that they are a result of transporting the drift fauna too. So, let us now conclude that in the North Atlantic, the subarctic sub gyre, northeast in the North Atlantic, has persisted during the whole Holocene. And that, and, and, and this, uh, should we say, gyre has largely influenced the climatic evolution in this period. So the key question will be, these intruders, will they persist? If they do, will, they, will the diversity increase? And will they also replace the existing fauna? So, in conclusion, tropical fauna has been introduced. It is there, but we don't know anything about how long it will be there and what will happen. A total of 98 warm water species, or warm, yeah, warm water is correct, but tropical, subtropical in distribution have been identified. So there is no question, warm water fauna has been introduced and found in plankton samples in 2010. And this was actually more pronounced after 95, 96, when the subarctic gyre collapsed. That was when there was an increase in the inflow of Atlantic water. So there was definitely a warm water pulse in 2009. And multi-periods of cold and warm events in the Arctic took place throughout the last century that we saw clearly. And that this has been repeated all through the Holocene is what we think. Another thing we can conclude is that siliceous material in the Arctic Ocean is not very common. Only in the surface. You drill into the glacial or into the Holocene and glacial, there is nothing. You drill and drill and drill until you reach the Eocene. Then you have shallow water marine, brackish water uh, um, ferns, and just a few diatoms, radiolarians, and ingredients and silicoflagellates. But from Eocene and up, you don't have anything of siliceous microfossils in the Arctic Ocean. So that was what we just re uh, reported on. And I think we can conclude there. And these are the guys who produced these results. So I think we just say thank you very much. And as you can see here, we have a Norwegian stamp with the warm water radiolarium. And this is the end. Okay.